the future, Kevin Warwick believes humans and robots will merge in a symbiotic existence. Implants and enhancements will transform the human race, upgrading our memories, changing how we communicate, augmenting and expanding our senses. Becoming a cyborg is the ultimate goal. Eight years ago, the professor of cybernetics at Reading University had an implant fired into his nervous system, allowing him to remotely control a robot hand with his brain. The professor is also experimenting with putting organic matter into electronic devices, most recently using cells taken from a rat brain to power the decisions of a robot body. But more about that later. First, here's Professor Warwick discussing one of his implant experiments in a little more detail. What I had was this little thing fired into my nervous system. So it actually went in there. Now this it has 100 electrodes on it. Very, very small, but the nervous system is very, very small. Each of the electrodes is one and a half millimetres long. Uh, there's 100 of them. The nervous system, the nerve fibres, the median nerve there, it's about four millimetres in diameter. So this was fired in about half of the way into the nervous system. And there were then wires running up my arm to this point here, and the wires came out onto this green connector pad, and I was able to wear what is this? Is a radio transmitter receiver unit. So as I moved my hand, my neural signals were transmitted by radio to the computer, and then out to pieces of technology. One of the things we did, uh, I went to New York, to Columbia University. We put my nervous system live on the internet, and I controlled a robot hand here in Reading University from my brain signals, my neural signals, on another continent. So it was showing that somebody that's had their hand amputated could have an artificial hand that they control from their brain, but for enhancement, the hand doesn't actually have to be on their body. The hand, or any piece of technology, can be wherever you want it to be, wherever the network takes you. So in the future, it means your body can be as big as the network. Your nervous system and the Internet are one. I think the most exciting part of the 2002 implant was when my wife had electrodes inserted in her nervous system as well, and electrically we linked our nervous systems together. So when she moved her hand, my brain received a pulse. We were actually picking up her neural signals, sending them across the internet to stimulate my nervous system. So when she went, doop, 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 my brain received doop, 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 three pulses, directly electrically, as it were, signals from her brain to my brain. That was tremendously exciting because it actually worked. I felt the signals from my wife's um, movements, and I could see that clearly with neural implants brain to brain, the same technology ultimately will be able to communicate directly brain to brain, if you like, by thinking to each other. But for the moment at least, Warwick and his wife will have to keep talking to each other in the traditional way. In the meanwhile, the professor has another research project keeping him busy, one which mixes rats and robots and sounds more like science fiction. What this is, is um, a multi-electrode array. It's a flat array within this little dish, uh, lots and lots of very small electrodes. And this is where we grow our robot brain, the biological brain. We take neurons from a rat embryo, separate them using enzymes, so they're completely dissociated with each other, and lay them out in this little dish, feed them, it's a little pink liquid with minerals and nutrients, keep it in an incubator, 37 degrees centigrade. Um, within a week, the neurons have linked together and if we put electrical signals on one electrode here, it will operate in a brain-like fashion and we will get responses in a, a reasonably reliable form from other electrodes. We then use that as the controlling mechanism for this robot here. So these are ultrasonic sensors. When the robot gets close to an object, signals are picked up by the sensors we send them to the brain to stimulate the brain. It then will output signals which we use to drive the robot left, right, 
forwards, the controlling mechanism of the robot. So what we do at the present time is take some basic way the brain operates, link it up to control the robot in that form, and then let the robot move around and move around. And what we find is, over a period of time, that the habit of doing a particular action strengthens the neural pathways and it gets better at doing it. Ultimately, Professor Warwick hopes to use human brain cells to power mechanical bodies, an investigation that could take him deep into a moral and ethical maze. But the professor is convinced that man and machine must merge, and that by doing so there will be very few limits to what humans can achieve. If, if I look to the way my human brain works without implants and compare it to the way an artificial intelligent brain works, uh, I can see quite a number of advantages for the artificial intelligent brain um, thinking in many dimensions. We, we use computers for that. My brain thinks in three dimensions at most on a good day. Uh, I would love to think in ten dimensions, but I can't. But as a cyborg linked to a machine intelligence system, I could. What is that going to mean? I don't know. Oh, let's, let's try it. Let's find out. I think it would give me a much more complex understanding of the world. Maybe even things like space travel in three dimensions is a problem. If we're even traveling to the edge of our solar system, it takes you all your life to get there, and then you can't come back again. Oh, that's no good. If we look in more dimensions, maybe it's trivial. It's just... Yeah, let's do it, because we're looking in five or six dimensions. So I think it opens up all new possibilities. Memory, clearly. The human memory is restricted. Here it is, particularly as you get older. You're cramming more and more stuff in, but it doesn't have more and more stuff. Marvin Minsky has said if you live to be 100, you can download your entire human memory onto a single CD. Now, he's from MIT, he must be right, that's how it is. But the point is, it's just a small memory space where if you look at an artificial intelligence system, it's networked. You're not talking about this little bit of memory that you're talking about, it, this network memory around the global memory. I'd love to have global memory. So if I need, I don't need to remember anything, it's in this, in this network. Great, I can use my brain for other things. So memory... Extrasensory input. Humans sense about 5% without our vision and hearing. It's about 5% of what's going on around us at any time. That's, our perception of the world is so restricted. I'd like to understand what's going on around me in ultraviolet and ultrasonic and x-ray. I want to have that broader experience. Um, communication, I think, is the biggest advantage, if you like, for artificial intelligence. How humans communicate is so pathetic. It's and this We have complex signals in our brains. We convert them to these mechanical pressure waves, speech, which is some trivial coded message. It bears hardly any relation to what we're thinking about. And for another person to try and understand, even if you've been married 50 years, your spouse has no idea, what are you thinking about that? If we could just send signals in parallel, from brain to brain, electrical signals, it gives us a whole new way of communicating in terms of colours, in terms of graphics, in terms of images, ideas, concepts. Think of communicating in that way, not this stupid coded thing that we have to do. So I think there's lots of advantages for artificial intelligence that if I upgrade to be a cyborg, I can have some of those.